In this video, I thought I would talk about the differences between a master's degree and a PhD. Uh, before I get into it, I thought I would preface this with saying that every place is different. So my experience won't necessarily be the same as your experience, although there will probably be some overarching similarities between my program that I went through versus, you know, yours or will be if you're thinking about going into a graduate program. There'll probably be a lot of similarities. I noticed that a lot of you are, well, some of you are high school students, so I'm not entirely sure what you're getting out of these videos, <laughs> but I'm glad that you, you enjoy them. But some of you, I noticed, are from European countries and, you know, places outside the United States. And they do diff things differently in other countries. But in the, just within the United States, there may be a difference between state and state, which is kind of interesting to see. But ultimately, I think a lot of, like a school, like a university is allowed to do what they want. And depending upon the quality of that university, it may carry more weight than somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? So, for example, a PhD program at Harvard or Yale or Princeton, Stanford, you get the idea. Those guys do some insane mathematics. Well, they do insane everything, more or less. Now, some schools, you know, they have their specialty. I believe Yale is, um, finance is their specialty, I think. I'm not entirely sure what Harvard is. I, I probably should know that, but I don't. But... You don't have to go to those Ivy League schools to get, you know, a good quality education. You know, there's a lot of schools like, you know, in the South and the Midwest and on the West Coast that, you know, they offer classes that rival any Ivy League school or something overseas like Oxford, for example. But anyway, I'm only going to talk about my own experience because that's the only thing I can really talk about in great detail. So maybe you'll get something out of it. Master's, Ph.D. So, when I was accepted into the master's program, I started... Master's is typically two years. It's very weird for a master's program to be more than two years. But the first year, for me, we really just took classes. We didn't really do any type of research or projects or anything like that. And then the second year is when you start doing your project. And then some places, you know, they'll have this thing called a 4 plus 1 program. I had a friend that did that where he had four years as an undergrad, basically got his bachelor's, and then they tacked on that one year of graduate school that wasn't really graduate school. But a 4 plus 1 program says basically, okay, this person has four years of undergrad plus a graduate level type education that's not technically graduate level. But it matriculated so that when he um, did the 4 plus 1 program, he only had one more year technically in the master's program, and then he got his master's degree. So some places do that. That's not what I did. So in the master's program, we'll put first year for first year. Uh, if you're like me and you did not get a bachelor's degree in mathematics they will typically want you to take some type of undergraduate level uh, math course, but a pretty advanced version of it. So this is when I took real variables. One and two, which is basically um, real analysis where you're just talking about functions of a real variable that are real valued. Um, specifically, I used this book, the Steen Peterson book. Uh, if you're interested in learning real analysis by yourself at the undergraduate level, this is a good book. I might even say that this book is better, Intro to Real Analysis by Bartle and Sherbert. These two together are pretty uh, ideal, I would say, for undergraduate level mathematics. Well, real variables, that is. And then on top of that, I took Modern Algebra. I took this at the same time which is abstract algebra, but it's the baby version. This class was easier than this class, in my experience. I know I mentioned a long time ago that uh, Americans typically 
those that study mathematics, if you compare like the best Americans in terms of <laughs> mathematics, so here's all the good Americans in mathematics and here's all the good international students in mathematics, Americans will typically be better at modern algebra. Well, this is a stereotype, obviously. I don't know how much truth there is to it. I'm losing the point here. But Americans will typically favor modern algebra, and then international students will typically favor real variables. I, This is the stereotype that I've been told. But, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Either way, these two classes are pretty tough. So that's what I took my first year. And then, uh, so I took real variables one and modern one together in a single semester. And then in the second semester, I took the sequels. But on top of that, I took an elective course, which usually they want you to do. So at my place where I went, they want you to take some sort of supplementary course, you know, that's like hiding in the background. And then depending on, you know, what they offer, you can only, you can only select what they offer. So this year they only offered... <laughs> Unfortunately for me, it was a coding theory course, which I wasn't really interested in taking coding theory. They had other options. They were like, well, there's advanced linear algebra. And I said, well, I've already taken advanced linear at the undergraduate level. Do you want me to take it again? And they said no. So they wouldn't let me take it again. I mean, I don't know why I would want to, but that's beside the point. And I think also maybe a geometry course was available, but I'd already taken that at the undergrad level. And they really didn't want me to repeat a course I already took. So the only option for me was coding theory. And this class I was not it, I was not a big fan of. And it wasn't because of the teacher or anything. It was the same teacher I had for these two. And the teacher was very good. I really liked the teacher. The problem is, is that I didn't like the material and the book that we used was not good. <sighs> I still have the book. But it just I didn't like the way it was written. I found it confusing. The homework problems were also contrived. Like, they were so long and computational. It was like you had, like, one problem was, here, compute this thing 16 times. And then say, okay, now here's a slightly different case and compute that thing 16 times. And that I really didn't like. Okay, so second year. So this is all, like, undergraduate-level math. But I took the graduate-level version, I guess you could say. And now, for the second year, we actually did some real graduate-level analysis, or graduate-level mathematics. And they called the course Real Analysis 1 and 2. 1 and 2. And then uh, Abstract Algebra 1 and 2. And I'll leave the third one blank for the time being. So what's the difference between this class and these classes? So everything up here is about, it's like calculus on steroids is what real variables is like. You're still in the world of calculus with real numbers and all that good stuff that you're familiar with, except they, they put the proofs in there. So you do proof-based calculus, and that's kind of difficult if you haven't really seen it the first time. Uh, for real analysis one and two, though, in the first semester, it was all measure theory. So... I think a lot of people that watch my channel are confused when I write real analysis here because that could mean a bunch of different things. Uh, it's kind of an umbrella term, um, at least in where I go to school. So real analysis one was really measure theory. And we used this uh, Richard Whedon book that I have here. We, we basically did the first five or six chapters of that measure, measure theory book. We didn't really get into abstract measures. It was only like Lebesgue measure and stuff like that. So that was the first semester. And then the second semester was more functional analysis where we used the Kolmogorov book. And then for this class, it's a really all group theory, ring theory, field theory. And then we finish up with Galois theory. Most abstract algebra courses are built that way. And again, I, uh, I excelled here and struggled here. And because I think because I struggled in the analysis courses, that's what drew me to it because I wanted to, it felt to me like this was a greater accomplishment. <laughs> it's not really a good reason, I think, to study something just because it bothers you that you're not good at it. But also at the same time, maybe it is, I don't know. But for me at the time, I felt like I had a pretty good grip on how to do algebra. 
but I did not have a good intuition or grip on how to do real variables or real analysis type proofs. And that's what I, that's ultimately why I chose it over algebra is because it bothered me that I sucked at it. And I'm not saying I'm good at algebra. I'm just saying I suck more at analysis. <laughs> okay. So what's the third one? Now, some places like where I went, you have a thesis option or a non-thesis option. So typically when you're about to graduate, they write these things called comprehensive exams where whoever teaches this class and this class, the sequence, I should say, they will write a comprehensive test that covers first semester and second semester material. You take it and then hopefully you pass it. If you pass it, everything's good. If you don't pass it, they'll usually let you take it again, but they give you the stink eye. And if you fail it twice, then I'm not sure what happens, <laughs> to be honest. But um, they write the comprehensive exams. I remember when I was in the master's program, this class, I, I pretty much aced this one. The, the test was not hard. The guy wrote a pretty easy test. I didn't sweat about this one at all. But the real analysis one was the one I was scared of. And many of us kind of went into this test, you know, clinched. We, I never got my score for either of these two. I know I passed this one. But for this one, I never got my score. And, like, we took it. And then, like, the next week, COVID-19 happened and everyone went remote. I, I, we were told that every, every person that took this test passed. But thinking about I barely remember the test and I'm not entirely sure if I should have passed to be honest I don't know what my score was hopefully it was pretty good I mean I technically I passed so I guess it was good enough is what what I'm saying and then so that's the two comprehensive exams so if you do the non-thesis option if you do the non-thesis option uh, the course that you supplemented your sequence with you will typically have a comprehensive exam in that field. So since I took coding theory, if I did the non-thesis option, I would have had to take a third comprehensive exam covering coding theory. But that's not what I chose. I chose the non, or excuse me, I chose the thesis option where in the second year, I essentially wrote a paper with, uh, with a faculty member. And the faculty member was the guy that taught this class, the real variables course. So, I'll write thesis. And if I uh, can find my thesis or paper or wherever, I'll probably talk a little bit about what kind of research I did if, if there's enough interest in it. So if this video gets to 5,000 views, I know a lot of people measure it based on likes, but if 5,000 people watch this video, then uh, I'll do the thesis. I'll talk about it. Anyway, so that was my master's program. Overall, pretty enjoyable experience. It was kind of strange, though, because <laughs> the first year there was a strike and everything was shut down for three weeks, which was interesting. And then in the second year, COVID happened, so everything got shut down again. <laughs> so I had a very, I had a very unusual master's experience those those couple years, but it was fun. I liked, I liked being, I liked the faculty, and I liked. I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't choose any other place to have done my master's, by the way. It was a, a lot of learning experience. Anyway, so what's the big difference between master's and PhD? Well, at the master's, it's pretty much like real, real analysis and abstract algebra. You know, those are the two. There was another sequence called numerical analysis that uh, if you were leaning more toward the applied side, you would take that, but I didn't lean toward applied. I, I leaned toward uh, pure math. So I didn't take that sequence, and I've never taken numerical analysis, although it looks interesting, although very stressful. PhD, there's, depending on where you go, if the university is bigger, this university over here was smaller than this one over here. So over here, we just covered the basics, meaning analysis and algebra. At a bigger university where I'm at now, they have a lot more courses that they offer and a bigger faculty so they can offer special topics courses. So in the first year, uh, if you're in pure mathematics, they have a sequence that you can do 
And the first course is the real analysis course, which uh, I had to take again, which is fine. I needed it. Where essentially, depending on who teaches it, you'll cover different topics. But um, the guy that taught real analysis for me was uh, big into measure theory. So we started with metric spaces and topological spaces, not much on topology. But we did talk a lot about metric spaces, and then we made the leap to measure theory. And we pretty much stay in measure theory until the very end of real 2, where we touch on LP spaces. So not much functional analysis here at all. There was functional analysis down here. That was the second semester. But up here, not very much. And then we need the abstract algebra course. Or again, it's group theory, ring theory, field theory, and then Galois theory at the end. Galois theory is just like a subset of field theory. It's usually lumped in there. Okay, so once you take this sequence, between your first and second year, you'll take the qualifying exam. And if you take the qualifying exam and pass, then you can do research in that area. And if the qualifying exam is really difficult... <laughs> Then you fail it, and then you have to take it again. So you're not officially allowed to do research until you pass those exams. And they give you a couple times to take it. If you keep failing it, they'll eventually kick you out. But such is life, I guess. And then what about the second year? Well, it kind of depends on what you want to take. So these are like topics courses. Uh, particularly, because I'm in analysis, they recommend we take probability theory which is basically applied measure theory. I can't write, which is what I really like. And then there's like the number theory courses, which are good uh, pure math courses. And I'm gonna write one and two here, but it's not really called that. It's just, I don't wanna write out the words algebraic number theory and analytic number theory. But those are some good topics to take. And then, you know, Depending on what they're teaching, you know, there's a slew of different courses you can take here. So be, just because I write stuff here doesn't mean that that's what you're supposed to take. You're not even really supposed – you're not, like, required to take these courses. But you are supposed to take something in order to ideally help you with your research. Because when you do a PhD, you're supposed to write a dissertation and then ultimately defend it. So anything that the math department or what you – feel like f will help you write your dissertation, you can take. It's just that these two above this line, those two sequences are the required courses. After it is like you do what you want. So because I'm analysis, I took potential theory. I also forgot about complex analysis. I took one and two. There's also some geometry courses. Geometry is like, geometry is weird. Never, I never really take a course that's like, you know, analytic geometry or algebraic geometry, if there is such a thing. I know there probably is, but they offer some of that stuff. Okay, so... In a perfect world, you would pass these two tests, and then you would pretty much start doing research immediately. Just try and find someone, try and, you know, make some sort of progress. And then after a certain amount of time, you definitely want to do, you want to pass candidacy. Because when you pass candidacy, what that means is the math department has deemed your project and your progress on that project worthy enough where you don't really have to take classes anymore. You can just work on the PhD, which is beautiful. Um, so a lot of people I know are in their fourth year and they're still taking classes. So usually if you're not, if you haven't made a ton of progress at that time, you know, you have the option of taking numerical analysis, not really recommended. These are more applied courses. I just know that when the pure math people run out of classes, they start taking applied math courses just to fill in the details, I guess. Again, there's a ton of courses and you take what you want to take. I spelled probability wrong, right? No, I spelled it right. Um, 
complex analysis should really be up here. It's just I wrote it down there. And I don't know. Maybe I'll write Fourier analysis slash harmonic analysis. I could even write functional analysis somewhere if I really wanted to. Essentially, these guys are topic. Not all of them, but a lot of them are topics courses. And then for the beyond stuff, this is really where you should be doing research. So I'll write it in capital letters, research. And ideally, you know, a PhD shouldn't take that long. You know, a PhD should really only last you four years. And in a lot of places, it's two-year master's, two-year PhD. So there's four years of graduate school there. But again, it kind of depends on where you go. So where I'm at, the average is four years here. So I'm pretty much looking at four years now. Right now, I am... I am like right here. I'm about to finish year two. And I have been asking around for a number to a number of my instructors for projects that I can work on. It's just that a lot of those instructors are nearing retirement and they don't really want to take on another graduate student this close to retirement. So there's not a whole lot of options. But of the people that are willing to work with me, I find they're project's pretty interesting, like I talked about the universal convex body on my channel, as well as some functional analysis type problems, which is, which is good. So I told myself when I started this program, so I'm going to finish up by saying this. When I started this program, I had already done this, so I have two years, you know, into a master's program. I told myself three years and then I'm done. But I'm almost starting my third year and I don't really have a project fully underway which means i'm probably best case scenario looking at four years five years is not super atypical i'll say this three years is fast four years is average five years is the most you really want to go beyond there are people that are there beyond five years but you don't really want that you want to you don't want to finish too fast where your phd is meaningless but you also don't want to drag your feet so that's how much I'll say about that. Anyway, let me know what you think about this timeline. I hope it was informative. And uh, if you have anything uh, to say comparing this to what you're going through, feel free to leave it in the comments if you want to share because uh, other people can benefit from it. Thank you.